Ah, hello my friends, hello my life warriors, wherever you are in the world, welcome to the Day In Day Out podcast, woo, ah, today on the podcast, I was very privileged to have uh, Jordan Power on, uh, he is a author, comedian and podcast host, uh, we talked about a number of things today, uh, very surprised how the conversation uh, went, we talked about his uh, podcast, uh, The Unmentionables, uh, we also talked about his uh, podcast uh, before he did The Unmentionable, uh, which was like one of the largest uh, gay podcasts uh, in the world. Uh, we also talked about um, climate change and like, hey, the political landscape uh, of the, well, of America and how it's changing uh, with regards to the Democrats and Republicans. Uh, yeah, very interesting chap. And yeah, I look forward to having him on again in the future uh, so please sit back uh, enjoy the podcast and yeah i'll say there's a couple of times it gets a little bit risque so sit back enjoy the show and yeah i look forward to having you on again and don't forget to subscribe peace <laughs> Ah, hello my friends, hello my life warriors, wherever you are in the world, welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast, Woo! today on the podcast, on episode oh, 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 129, I have the immense pleasure to have Jordan Power, now... This, <laughs> this young man, he is an author, comedian, and podcast host. He has a show called The Unmentionables, and all I've got to say is, yes, uh, <laughs> this, I think this, this is going to be an interesting one today, my friends. I'm it's the most cool. interesting guest you'll ever have on, I promise <laughs> you, I, I, by far. Well, you know what, Jordan, like, how are you doing today, and what's been going on? Uh, I just came from uh, what I well, I'm in Toronto. We're under communist rule where facts and empirical data don't matter. So we just open and close things based on no information, just uh, feelings. Wow. So I'm not loving that. Uh, but I just came from, uh, let's just say uh, I've accessed the underground economy at this point for haircuts and other things like many others. So <laughs> that's I, w I won't say where I came from, but let's just say that's where I came from. Okay. Before we recorded, <laughs> uh, it's like uh, yes, any authorities in the Canadian area? He doesn't live in Toronto whatsoever. He lives in. Get me! I'm not scared of any of you people. <laughs> like you know what, Jordan? I've got to ask. Like you are an author, comedian, and a podcast host. Like now, I've had a couple of comedians on uh, on the podcast, and I've always had to ask. What have they been doing to sort of get their reps in at this moment in time? Because, look, as you say, you live in communist Canada where, like, the numbers don't make any sense, but they keep locking things down. Um, what have you been doing to sort of keep yourself comic sharp, as they say? Uh, my podcast, honestly, I mean, a lot of I've never been a victimhood person. I sort of, uh, you know, I, I kind of learned from my therapist and growing up that, like, Yes, there are shitty things about the world and there's ways that you're discriminated against and so many different factors. But I sort of found a way to always just kind of pick myself up and find my resilience and grit and find solutions. And so I've been doing my podcast, uh, just keep building a fan base. I mean, that's kind of the business I'm in. I've only been in the entertainment business for less than two years, um, but kind of had a really fast rise with my old show, Shame on You. Um, where I was selling out shows in New York, shows in Toronto, like big 150 person shows because the, sh the podcast just took off. Mm. And now I'm doing a, a more broader show. And so I use it as kind of I try out bits on the show. I interview. I do wacky comedic interviews. So I'm always kind of keeping that muscle going. And then the great thing is, you know, when things open up, I'll have a larger fan base and just I can sell out bigger shows. So I'm really in the process of just keep growing the fan base. Um, and a very broad fan base. I, I normally had gay men before, but because my new show's not gay, it's everyone. It's just people who want to laugh right now. Right. Yeah. Like this is the thing. You before we started this, you mentioned shame on you. Uh, your previous podcast. I'm, I'm I'm gonna have to say yeah. Please tell the people what that previous podcast was about because I was like it made me chuckle. Let's just say. Well, it was a it was a, when you're a gay person, you always have a level, little bit of a residual shame, right? You're taught to that there's something wrong with you. You're an aberrant your whole life. Mm. And so 
it always carries over and in, into substance abuse or other issues, the way you approach relationships. So, I mean, we were 30, me and my best friend, and we sort of just we weren't fully comfortable with being gay yet. And so we thought, what's the best way to eradicate shame? Well, the best way to eradicate shame is to shine a light on it and put it all out there. And so society very much encourages gay men or other LGBT or honestly all people, but particularly gay men, we're supposed to stay quiet about our sex lives because, you know, we're deviants, we're sodomites, all the stuff that we're taught our whole lives. And so we decided, why don't we, why don't we operate the antithesis of that? Why don't we just be so outrageous, put it all out there, don't give a fuck. All our fears push through our boundaries and all our comfort zones. And so the first episode of the podcast was my uh, friends with benefits of a year, a bisexual closeted man. And I said to him, hey, do you want to record a podcast? And we interviewed him about what it was like to have a sexual relationship with me in the dark. And then it just spiraled from there. And we kept interviewing like our ex-boyfriends and uh, one night stands. I interviewed a stripper I went on a date with. And obviously, when something's uh, really you can't turn it off, one could say a train wreck in some ways. People yeah. couldn't turn it off. And at the end of the podcast, it was only for about 16 months. We were we had done like millions of downloads. Wow. Like, OK, like this is the thing I have to ask, like, like, does the podcast still exist? Like, What happened? Because I would imagine you'd be like going, OK, um, what is that? podcast um which was done by barstool like the two ladies had oh call her daddy yeah had the issues i don't like you know what i mean but it sounds like millions of downloads everything going like steam like a steam train yeah what went and then my friend well it was a convergence of a lot of different issues for one i was just 30 i was almost 33 at that point and i just sort of the whole like rigmarole of going on dates and hooking up and partying all night uh just kind of lost its luster after a while and i just well, kind of wasn't i wasn't that interested in talking about those things i like politics the environment like i like more heady stuff also my friendship was ending um for reasons related to the podcast but also just we'd grown apart in a lot of ways and that was the secret sauce of the podcast was two best friends unapologetic mm. imperishable bond uh, we had great sense of humor together and our chemistry started to die. So at that point, I was just kind of like, don't really want to do the show anymore. We're not friends anymore. And I want to go in a new direction with my comedy. And so I ended the podcast at the same time I released my book called Famous Anus and uh, great title. Yeah. And uh, then I just kind of moved on. I took five months off and I started Unmentionable. Yeah, because like, OK, I understand. It might have. Was it? I can imagine if you're doing a podcast about like, you know what I mean? Past relationships, one night stands. And like, basically if you're like, okay, you're kind of like tired of the whole, like hunting single scene. Like that, would you think that, did it kind of get in the way of any sort of potential future relationships because people knew who you were and they were like, going, I don't like, I don't want to be on that because of this or they yeah. want to get on to the show because hey well anyone that would want to get on the show for sleeping with me probably has mental health issues that i would probably need to avoid if they wanted to just sleep with me for that reason uh but yes we laid bare our soul i mean it was like certain podcasts are successful because the host mine their personal life for content mm. so your life becomes a show and it's exhausting. It's a great secret sauce. It works really well because people tune in every week and they get to learn every aspect of your personal life, not just my sex life. You know, like my dad died in the beginning of the pod or in the middle of the podcast. And we just sort of recap that or my host broke up with his boyfriend and we, we re like it was it was gritty and it was super real and authentic. But I felt like I was a monkey. I felt like I was like dancing for people. And I had to always bring something to the show every week that was interesting, like who I dated, what kind of drugs I did. Like, it was just, I was like, I felt like a clown. And uh, doing the show now that I do, I very much look externally rather than in internally. Because honestly, at some point, it does become self-obsession when you are just documenting every aspect of your life every week. Yeah, like, this is the thing. I can imagine with regard to, say, like, a video vlog, which you put up on YouTube, which, you know what I mean, highlights of your day, everything like this. When you're having... Uh, a proper full-on conversation it's not as much as you might want to hide something 
they, it will come out all out in the wash eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, uh, some pain most probably is lying in, is lying there, I imagine. Yeah, and I, I also think like, like you mentioned, I was radioactive. Like I could not forge emotional relationships. And it was at a time for the first time in my life where I had gone through such intense therapy and I was actually ready for adult relationship because from the age of about 24 till let's say 32, I was a complete mess. Mm. I was a cute guy that had a fun personality that could get away with anything, but I was self-destructive. I mean, in my book, I, I have sex with my boss. Like not recommended, <laughs> you know, if you're trying to climb the corporate ladder, you know, it, maybe it works. In my situation, it didn't. But I was just completely and utterly out of control and um, inebriated and doing a lot of drugs. And let, don't get me wrong. Like, it was so much fun. I lived an amazing life. But I'm 34 now. I'm going to be 35 next year. And it just it's like it loses the appeal. It really does. When life loses its luster. Oh, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> no, like that is a bit, that is mental. Uh, so, with all of this, the podcast, like like your first podcast, which was like going crazy, going gangbusters. Where did you find the time to write your book and the book name of the title of your book again? Because hey, I'm I'm gonna make you say this a number. Of times. I like saying it just for your face, truly. <laughs> so famous anus. <laughs> That is the name of the book. And the cover is a anus in a tuxedo on a red carpet for like a Hollywood event. Genius, yeah. if I do say so myself. Um, I wrote it. <laughs> I wrote it slowly after over like four years um, and kind of rewrote it almost three times because it, it was just sort of something I did when I had some time and it didn't have any cohesion or like a through line to the book. And then when I met my editor and we worked together, we kind of realized that it was really a memoir of 10 years of my life. And it did have a theme. And the theme was that I was uh, didn't know how to love others and I didn't know how to love my, myself. And so there really is an arc to the book of a really broken person at 23 years old, breaking up, getting out of this relationship and then going on this crazy 10 year journey, trying to find love with none of the tools, with a lot of self-loathing. Um, and just then by the end, you kind of come to current day where I am at and you do see the growth as a character. And I think that's really rewarding as a reader, right? You just want to see, you do want to root for the character because I'm traditionally kind of like an anti-hero. Like I'm not your typical, uh, person that you would root for, but then by the end, you really do just because you kind of understand me and where I'm coming from and that I'm really just an insecure comedian that just really wants to make people laugh because I think that's the only way I'll get love mm, mm. so with like with your famous anus book <laughs> now with the whole 10 year, like your 10 year journey like what would you say were some of the key things you discovered about yourself over that 10 years uh wow I mean first of all I I discovered that uh your how your parents treat you when you're younger will absolutely bleed into your how you approach romantic relationships um, unless you do a lot of work on yourself and really try to understand yourself. And I had a really absent father, really emotionally unavailable father, and uh, a, combined with a mother who was neglected by him. And so I got a little bit from her too. And so I just was kind of this person that was very distrustful, very guarded, very aloof. Um, and I just sort of approached every relationship like it was a show. It was like a comedy show, like... You know, I, I, I just dated people because I sometimes I thought it was funny or I thought it was interesting or I just didn't approach life with any seriousness. Mm. Uh, I just kind of took nothing seriously, including myself. And then that thing I learned about myself is just that um, just how to love myself. I really did learn how to uh, how do you really do gain confidence and you really and I find with this younger generation like Generation Z, you know, they, they get the stereotype of being fragile and easily offended um and i do kind of feel like that's true especially was me when i was younger because getting confidence and loving yourself really comes out of overcoming obstacles and accomplishing things and then finding love in yourself and and so as i grew up and accomplished things and overcame goals and kind of became resilient i really became this person who was like damn i can i'm, I'm a bad bitch i can do anything <laughs> Yeah, no, like this is the thing, man. Look, I can understand like 
where you're coming from and the sort of it makes sense if you've discovered how your father's true sort of sexual identity the way you discovered it uh, over a website and like going okay right that that okay was it like oh now that kind of makes sense or was it kind of like you know what I mean? I, I'm trying to be as respectful here. I know you've... Oh, well, I think we talked about that off the recording. So I'll explain to the audience. I found out my dad was gay because uh, he left the computer open on a website called squirt.org. You can go check it out yourself. And it's really just a hookup site for public uh, fornication. And so that was the basis for my parents' divorce is I told my mom, I didn't even confront him because we didn't really have a good relationship. And then my mom immediately divorced him. And at the time, she didn't see any signs that he was gay or neither did I. But then obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, And then in retrospect, she's thinking like, oh, this moment and that moment and this and this and this. And so it was kind of an interesting thing. But then my dad, when we confronted him about being gay, completely abandoned our family. He went to the other side of Canada, started a new family with a woman, um, completely in denial. And uh so I think the impetus for shame on you and the gay advocacy work I've done and kind of my book and stuff like that was like, God, I just want to be the antithesis of this man. Yeah. No, like this is the thing. Wow. I, I'm just very surprised that your father actually just went, OK, I'm going to the other side of the country, now starting another family with another lady, because I thought that would have been like quite a relief for him if he came with if you get what I mean, sort of quite freeing, just like, uh, okay, I've got all this pressure off me now and I can be who I'm meant to be, if you get what I mean. But, like, I don't... No. I, I, you know what? I think a lot of people, when they come out, they either go, like, two ways. They go, like, finally, I'm free. My mental health is better. I'm, op- I'm living an honest life. Mm. And then I think there's a faction of those people that... Uh, just completely and utterly abandoned. They're completely living in denial. They don't want to come out of the closet. They're being forced out of the closet. They hate themselves so deeply that they think I'll die with this secret. Mm. And that was very much how he died. My dad did die with that secret. He never admitted to it. And he just sort of went and started a new life with this woman. And and it was so crazy to me because at simultaneous to that, I'm doing this podcast for gay men all over the globe uh, and it's massive and, you know, people are coming out of the closet and I'm more comfortable with myself. And I have a father who is the complete and utter opposite of that. Yeah, because like this is the thing, like 21st century, 21st century world. And like, you know, what I mean, some things have moved forward. Some things have moved sideways and some things have just stayed firmly in the past. Uh, would you say like, OK, from when you kind of had your sort of sexual awakening until like now, the sort of 10 year period, like, would you say it's become easier for people around you, you know, who are gay coming out? Or is it a case of it's still a very much a hard personal thing? Uh, I always say to people doing the podcast, uh, it was great. And a lot of people came out, a lot of people were proud of who they are, but it also reminded me of the glacial pace of social change. I mean, we had listeners in countries where it was illegal to be gay and they would write us emails from the Middle East and Russia and different places and say they were living in fear. But also I always say to people, you know, I live in one of the most gay friendly cities in the world, Toronto. Um, and I say, if it's so good and we've made so much progress, which we have made progress, but if it's still, if it's so good, then why do I know so many men in their forties financially independent that are still closeted? Are they not picking up on social cues from society that there's something wrong with them or they won't be able to advance at their job or uh, different, different things or self-hatred or their family won't accept them. And so I always remind people that like, sure, you see like, yes, queen and queer as folk and all these shows and and whatever. Uh, but you have or sorry, queer eye, <laughs> it's like queer as folk, it's like old, but queer eye, like on Netflix. And you see this, but it's like it's still very bad. It's still quite bad. Mm. And uh, I still see a lot of pain in, in people and I still go on apps and there's married guys and closeted guys. And it's it's still quite terrible mm. like, because like this is the thing. It's taken you sort of 10 years of like introspection and like work on yourself to get to well, to get to this point. And like, OK, some people might not go, OK, 
doing a podcast for millions of people around the world might not be the sort of ideal thing for them, but it's a case of it worked for you to help other people. And like, this is the thing, that type of pressure uh, to help him relieve that type of pressure of people to let them know they're not alone uh, must have felt really rewarding to you. It was rewarding, but it was also exhausting. It was a, uh, it was such a range of emotions, you know, like doing the show was so fun. We had on like porn stars. We had on like professional athletes that came out. We had on a gay priest. We had on like just a, we had, we brought on our families. Like it was kind of this like Howard Stern esque show for gay guys. Like it was just kind of wacky and wild and sexual and dirty. Like it was just kind of this thing. But also um, I also realized that like people would project onto us what they wanted us to be or what we weren't. And they also kind of saw us as these like gay heroes. And, um, you know, I think when you make someone to a role model, sometimes you can be really disappointed. And I would just felt like people were trying to control me. They wanted me to say certain things. They want to be, behave certain ways. Um, and they were like, when I would say something they didn't like disagreed with, they would like treat me like I was, they were really disappointed in me like a parent. You know, like I'd let them down yeah. and I hated that aspect of the show. I hated how people would just try to change me. And so I do a show now where I don't talk about my personal life. Like I probably talked about my sex life once and we've done 20 episodes um, just because I got burned very hard and I learned really quickly how vicious the crowd is. Like I turn off my YouTube comments because I just don't care. Frankly, right. <laughs> I just don't care. Now, this is the thing. Like, um, yeah with regards to like, yeah, people putting other people on a pedestal. And if you're in that situation, like it's, how can I say, you, everyone falls, everyone mm -hmm. falls. Once you're on that pedestal, everyone falls at some point. And it's like, going, look, don't put that on me. Let live, let live, let's carry on and move forward. But like with the unmentionables, uh, yeah, like <laughs> you have, like, okay, you may have done only 20 episodes, but you've had a sort of colorful array of like things <laughs> going on. Like the most recent one, yeah. Like premier shit. <laughs> it's like, yeah. With regards to the nurse and the only fans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like, so my current show, it's unmentionable, no S, just unmentionable, uh, um, is my current show is kind of a continuation of the old show. Like I've always been interested in what is traditionally the seedy underbelly of society, the mm. people you don't hear from, you don't see them on the mainstream news and uh, they're kind of pushed to the edges of society. And that's very much what gay people are. And so unmentionable is like the kind of people I have on my show are like people you just don't, you shouldn't hear from. You shouldn't hear them talking. And so I've had on porn stars yeah. which, you know, many people demonize porn stars, but then consume their porn uh, strippers. I've had on a guy who was an illegal immigrant. So he just came to Canada and stayed. Um, I've had on the girl you're just talking about. She was a nurse who was fired for having an OnlyFans account. Um, I have on a guy <laughs> this Friday coming up is he's called the Sperminator. And he's a guy who was a father. He's the world's most famous sperm donor. And he was a father to he's a father to over 80 children. So he just gives his sperm for free to women all over the world. He's all over the press. Um, so I like comedy, right? Like it's a comedy show and I'm a comedian. So that's obviously what I gravitate towards. But I do the content that no one else does. Like our show very much, our guests are very unique. I had a girl that makes $9.99 a month by, on OnlyFans just by burping for men. <laughs> Wait, no, no, say that again, please. She she makes you pay nine ninety nine a month for her OnlyFans and people have a burping fetish, so she will burp for people and uh, and essentially that they get off on that. I don't know if they masturbate to it or or whatnot, but so she found her niche right and like you know it's an economy. Do what you want, but <laughs> it's wacky. So like that's what I like. I like these people where you're like, I didn't even know that was a thing, and then I'm like, here you go. I did not know that was a thing either, but like, yeah, nine ninety nine to listen to a lady, but okay, like you know what I mean. Look, if people are down with that. They're down with that. <laughs> it's just like, wow. 
Like, yeah. Did she say how much she was, apart from 999, did she give you a grand total of how much she was making? Oh, she's making thousands of dollars a month. Oh, God damn. We're in the wrong business, son. We're in the wrong business. I know. I know. I tell you. I, I'm over here trying to have a talent and learn how to write and be successful, but apparently you just have to burp. Or on TikTok, you just dance in your bedroom and you're famous. I mean, it's just, it's depressing, frankly. Yeah, no, like, this is the thing. Like, I would say... If 2020, well, if the pandemic didn't happen, I think OnlyFans would be a different animal. It's kind of like it's just outside of the mainstream, but it's just kind of like, yeah, people were, like people know about it. People kind of like there are people who will judge it, but it's a case of ultimately when you hear people like, yeah, making thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands, and like there are people making millions. A month doing that you're like going, what the hell is going on with the world it's crazy but like you know. it's well and it's cool what's cool now about like i mean i'm cynical about a lot of things but particularly what i think is really cool at this moment in time is that uh the gatekeepers of the entertainment business and the people who traditionally ran all facets of uh entertainment so like you know porn in porn in the past was like you needed to get a studio and they needed to accept you mm -hmm. now you can just do this or like if you have a book now you know like you can just self-publish it put it on amazon you don't have to worry about publishers like it really is a cool time that like if you're talented or if you have something that people need you can make a lot of money independently and that's why i love the show i do now is like I don't need to be on a podcast network i used to work in the mainstream media in these news places you can't have honest conversations and i can't be canceled like, what are you going to do? I control all aspects of my life. I independently book my live shows. I, I control. I have 100% control of my show and my books. So what are you going to do? You can't really cancel me and I get to be free. Mm, yeah. Like, this is the thing. With the unmentionable, how many sort of, like, downloads are you sort of getting, um, like, on a day or a month? Or you're not sort of really doing that at this present time? So I thousands i mean a, f a small percentage of the people listen on youtube and then that's like a few hundred mm. uh some of them have like a thousand views but for the most part uh we get thousands of audio downloads i don't know the exact numbers because i kind of made a rule my old show is really obsessed with the numbers and i would constantly check the numbers and then i would like censor myself or i would like you know just just so many factors i became obsessed with the numbers and we had sponsors and everything with our old show so now I said to my producer that like for the first 12 months, I just want to get my groove back. I just want to have fun. I don't want to obsess with the numbers. He looks at the numbers and he says they're going up every week. So which is great. But for the most part, I don't look. I know there's thousands of people listening every week, but I don't I don't obsess with that because I feel like it takes the joy out of the fun of growing a show. I mean, if you're obsessing about your numbers, then you 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 kind of lose the fun and the experience and the process of creating the product so i just come in i i punch it up i'm much more obnoxious on my show like people that listen to my show are like god this guy's like wild but when you meet me in person i'm so chill but it's it's audio it's you have to be bombastic or nobody will listen to you mm, like i would say you are kind of tim dylan-esque like without going off like yeah i love tim dylan yeah yeah like from what I've listened, like you do go off on the run every now and then, but it's like, yeah, but you know what I mean? He was like, hey, hey. So, yeah, I do like, I do like. Yeah, I love, I love Tim. Honestly, uh, Tim is great. Uh, I think he's, he's more negative and cynical than me. Like, I do, yeah, he's almost lost all hope. Uh, I have some hope, <laughs> but you're right. I love Tim. I, I've listened to Tim. I've, I listened to a bunch of people. I try to learn from everyone. I actually think my interviewing style is more Howard Stern because I grew up on Howard Stern. Like I just knew how Howard Stern operated. And so my interview style is very uh, punchy and quick questions. Um, whereas you're right, the right do, do very Tim Dillon kind of ranting. So, yeah. So, no, like this is the thing. I, I, I look upon it and I like the way you got your set up and like you've got your whole studio set up and everything like this. Uh, it shows like a sort of you're aiming, you're aiming high and you're aiming to make this a real thing. Like, I, I know you don't look at the numbers, but it's a case of like, where would you like to sort of be in like, say, maybe three to five years time? Or are you not thinking that far ahead? Um, You know, it's like, I, I have a, you know, I have a goal of 
a million downloads an episode. That's like in my head. And I, I do have a lot of self-confidence that I know I could get there. Um, I do want to make a living doing it. I mean, I make a, I make good money off my book and kind of all this stuff. I do want to make it my main source of income and living. Um, I just also don't want to compromise, though, in the process of getting there because you can build a really big fan base by being agreeable and acting like a celebrity where you don't really have opinions and you don't say anything provocative. Um, that's why like people love Reese Witherspoon because she doesn't ever say anything where you're like, Oh my God, I'm offended. It's like you get on a red carpet, you talk a certain way, like a robot. So I think the way my personality operates is I'll have a very, uh, rabid fan base because I'm polarizing. So I'll have people that absolutely hate me, but I'll have people that really love me. And like my Patreon's been growing over the past few weeks. Um, for that reason, right? And so that's where I want to get to. I want it to be a massive show. I've I've built this studio. I put 15 grand into it. This is like a high production value studio. It's got four cameras. Like I'm really going forward and going to the top because, you know, I, I saw Joe Rogan, you know, some random guy, you know, I mean, he's super talented, but it's like him and another person getting stoned in a room and he's doing 10 times the audience of Fox and CNN. Oh, yeah. Oh, like this is the thing. Um, there are some podcasters out there which are really sort of bringing something new to the world and like yeah you mentioned joe rogan yes um you've got the tim dillons of the world who like cynical as he might be but he is moving up steadily like and very strongly like um um flagrant too those guys mm -hmm. andrew shorts and like his cohorts like they are like you know what i mean really sort of getting out there but like, uh, I remember, was it, I think it was two years ago, I was reading an article, I believe, on the BBC, and they did the top 10 podcasts in the world. And Joe Rogan didn't even appear in, like, in the top of 10. Of course. I was like, going, I was like, are you aware of who he is and what he's doing? Obviously not. And it, I can't even remember what was number one. It was that sort of... But that, but that's the mainstream media elitist kind of New York Times mentality where they want safe content that's not offensive and the people want real authentic content. And so, you know, it used to happen with our old shows. We had more downloads than any gay podcast mm. uh, in North America. Probably, let, let's say Canada be safe, but we were the biggest gay male podcast and like we couldn't get press. They would do they would do like lists of like top 10 podcasts like for gay guys and whatever. And I knew we had bigger audiences than all of them. And, and but it was because we were we were on the edge. We weren't saying the party lines. We were, quote unquote, transphobic because we had concerns about uh, nine year olds getting hormones or like just, you know, nuanced, reasonable positions that didn't toe the party line. And I thought it was so funny. Like you see all these lists and I'm like, yeah, the people are all listening to our show. So like eventually I didn't care, but it was so interesting because I've experienced that. Mm, yeah, no, I think it's a case of, like, when you mentioned earlier about, like, yes, um, Gen Z getting it easier and everything like this, I think with regards to, like, uh, Gen Z, like, I think they're, they're being coddled at some times a little bit too much, and, like, the whole thing is what people forget, kids are some of the most resilient people you'll ever meet. They like they can think it, things through logically. You give them like a problem, and they will figure it out. Um, and I think with that sort of level of some places in society, just like you kind of like a like take take off the cotton wool, let them get bruised up a little, and learn something about themselves because all it's gonna do is delay a lot of things they should have got hold of or got well worked out years ago but I do. yeah so it's like yeah well i mean and I, I what i find about generation z because i do know some people that are younger and um the, a lot of the stereotypes are true in terms of like they're they're emotionally coddled meaning like they live online so they are served through their algorithm a complete so narrative on every news story that is exactly their bias it's like the people who just watch msnbc every night and they think they know everything I mean, it's like until you because I'm one of the rare people that takes in all media. Like I listen to NPR and I watch Fox News mm -hmm. and people are like, well, how is that? I'm like, because until you understand the biases and where they're coming from, then you really don't have a full picture of everything. So I come to my show like very 
know, people say I'm centrist. People will say I'm right wing. People say I'm left wing. And it's just not that I'm just like really independent. I just I look at everything just kind of like, yeah, what is what it is. But with Generation Z, they're very coddled and they believe that certain words should be censored and they believe certain people should go away. And that if something's said on Twitter that they don't agree with, they get to report it. And sometimes it's removed. Um, they believe that Jordan Peterson, when he gets a book deal, they sit at work and there were reports of the younger kids crying and saying they wanted to quit because they gave him a book. And then, like, I think that when you grow up like that, I, I always go, God, if that's what's going to push you over the edge, God help you with, if you get assaulted or if you your parents die or you go through extreme hardship in life. God help you because you will not know how to deal. No, because life will get very real, very fast. And uh, before you know it, like, yeah, it's fruit punch, fruit punch, and you're down. And uh, uh, put it this way, I think with regards to like the global pandemic, say, I think that's kind of opened some people's eyes to like, oh yeah, it can go, it can go south very quickly. Um, maybe I need to sort of like, toughen up maybe I need to get a little bit more focused about what I'm doing on my sort of day-to-day -day life to sort of handle these situations but you know how it is it's kind of like now it's kind of every day mundane normal I watched this um I watched this TikTok um basically it was like lady like two like it's 20, March 2020 and like you see her spraying down keys and like wiping everything down with disinfectant. Tw March 2021, she just bold like takes off a mask and just looks like a corona. It's like ah, it's like. So it's I mean, of, it, isn't that? I mean, isn't it crazy though? Because but also, I still have friends that will not leave the house. Like I have people that they're so their anxiety disorder just runs their life. They're governed by it, and I think that's extremely terrifying. But also like. Um, you know what? One of the things I have said about COVID on my show, which is interesting and reasonable conversation, is that like I had a guest kind of bring this up: is that eight out of ten people that are sent to hospital with COVID are obese, right? Mm. So you hear very much the hospitals are overwhelmed, blah blah blah. Well, I have a family that's all healthcare workers; they're always overwhelmed. But the conversation that's not being had is that 80% of the people that are overwhelming those hospitals are obese. This is a conversation about health. This is a conversation about taking life into your own hands and autonomy and that the virus isn't going to care how woke you are. It's really just going to come and kill you at COVID-21 if you're carrying an extra 60 pounds. Mm -hmm. But you don't hear that anywhere because people are so coddled and they say, like, how dare you say this and this about me? And that's one of the conversations that needs to be ha had right now is that, like, should the government step in and and have some sort of program to take care of people instead of shoving them in their apartments and watching their physical and mental health decline? Well, like, this is the thing I would say globally. Um, yeah, well, I haven't actually seen any country around the world, like, be it developed or not developed coming up or like basically being in China, which have like gone, okay, put the emphasis on like, okay, you need to get more exercise. You need to like, make sure you push yourselves, like get in shape because like this definitely has a type it likes. And like, yeah, if you are out of shape, if you do have the extra weight, this virus, or if you've got a pre-existing condition with all of those factors, this virus loves you guys and loves you guys literally to death. But yeah, actually seeing that conversation, like it's been a case of, okay, let's wait for the vaccine and then we can get our back, back our lives together and take it from there. Because there was a time where you saw all of the NBA stars like get it. And it, like obviously they're on the super fit side of the spectrum of things. But I think maybe a couple of them sort of really sort of suffered, if you get what I mean, from like having COVID. Apart from that, mm -hmm. like, yeah, I had COVID. Well, isn't it's like anything in life. You know, I said to people on my podcast, I said, you know, it's a, it's a respiratory disease. If you're going to smoke, if you're going to have weed, eat it. Like that's a small change you can make in your life. You shouldn't be smoking weed every day 
and in hurting your lungs. And then, you know, something happens to you because I do know a guy who's 39 with asthma and died mm. of COVID. There are those people out there. And so you're right. The conversation is very little of it is talked about mitigation. Is that like eat weed, don't smoke it, lose weight. Vitamin D, you know, was shown at the beginning of the pandemic was shown to have a massive effect in zinc scientifically backed. And how many times do we have to watch our leaders go up in a press conference and never once did they say, Hey, grab some vitamin D it's $8. If you're low income, we'll cover the cost. Mm. And that, and the obesity, the hospitals would have never been overwhelmed, but this stuff is like to some people, they take it so personally when you say to them, Hey, you have to lose weight because you're killing yourself. And they go, how dare you? You're not, you're fat at phobic or you're not body positive and it's like no your biomarkers don't care about how woke you are they mm. will just come and, and take you down no no i agree and like it's just it's been a ludicrous time and it's a case of i think going forward i think there has to be some real sort of conversations which need to happen and like sort of some reality checks what need to happen and I know people, when it comes to sort of brutal honesty, like, let's just say most people like to, how can I put it, shy away from that big time. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, I don't like, yeah, you telling me the truth? I don't need that in my life. Yeah, the truth. Well, the truth hurts, yeah. right? The truth hurts. And that's actually one of the things I can't stand about liberalism is it's like when you become very left wing, like far left, you become a very emotional person. And I think in a lot of ways that's good because you – Uh, are empathetic and you want to take care of others. But unfortunately, very emotional people are not rational people. That's been proven many times. It's why people that are far left are not good at business, because if you're too emotional at business, you'll probably fail. You'll take everything personally. And so that's one of the things about uh, like far left liberalism is that facts don't penetrate. And because they go, this is my, this is how I feel about my body. And you can't tell me I'm overweight. And I do, you don't know I'm, I'm unhealthy and, this is how I feel. And I'm, I'm overcome by my emotions. And that's where you get into problems with people taking things personally that n- are not at all personal. Yeah. Like, this is the thing. Like, I, like, with regards to the sort of people on, like, ultra left or ultra right, like, I can't, like, with myself, I, I can't sort of, like, oh, yes, I'm a leftist or I, I'm a rightist because it's a case of there is going to be some, some things I would definitely lean left to there's going to be some things i definitely lean right to and then basically trying to find my way through the whole sort of messiness of life to sort of like go okay this is my sort of trying to put together my coherent thought about it all and like look uh, with regards to some of the wokest politics which go out there no, it, it's definitely not going to work. It's just like, yeah, it, with like the sort of ultra right politics would go out there, you kind of go, no, no, it's not going to work. No, come together. Yeah, you know what is the, the hot button issue now is is trans rights, right? In the sense hmm. that, like, if you pull a lot of this stuff, uh, it's not at all what you would see on the mainstream channels. Meaning, the if when you pull people, they know that a person cannot be a man for twenty five. 23 years have all the development of a man mm. uh you know fast twitch muscle fibers pelvis you know we we separate men's and women's sports for a reason because we acknowledge there is a difference between men and women in sports but you cannot do that for 23 years and then take estrogen for uh, for a year or two and then go and compete against women it just has been shown you still have a 13 percent advantage and we're being told by the these mainstream channels that like you're transphobic for not just letting it fly. And you look at MMA and contact sports. I mean, Fallon Fox in the MMA cracked a woman's skull. I mean, this is real. These are real things. And I think if you had a daughter in sports, I think you would think differently. And I don't know what the answer to the solution is, but when you pull most people on this subject, they say, yeah, that's not fair, of, of course, but they also want to support trans people and like me, but I can't not acknowledge that there's something happening there and it's scientific. Yeah, but this is the thing with regards to like the science. Yeah, it comes down to sort of biology on that side of things, and like it has been there for a very long time. That body of work of information, and like if you're going to go, yeah, that makes no sense anymore. Then what was the point of having all of this for 
hundreds of years being like correlating this information which stands true no and like oh this is and with regards to trans rights look if you want to join the military you can like join the military if you want to adopt kids adopt kids if you want to like live wherever you want to live in the world great but you can't have everything no one can have everything right maybe like maybe giving up sports on a professional level where it's like yeah you might have to give that up. but it's one of those things that you know the other the other because when people say trans rights like well there's so many facets of trans rights like for example when you look at the uh when you look at a it's called gender dysphoria i mean that's literally what it's called so when you're a young kid the vast majority of of people of boys let's say that experience some form of gender dysphoria like me when i was younger i would wear women's clothes or i'd always want to be the woman in the sport in the video games and stuff like that when you look at that the vast majority of those over 80 percent will grow up to just be gay men they might be effeminate gay men but they just could be gay men gay men and then a percentage of those will be trans people but that is why you cannot give hormones to a nine-year-old because the research shows that the majority of them will outgrow it if you give them hormones when they're nine you're do doing something to their body that's completely irreversible and now you're in a situation like you're seeing now. There are thousands of detransitioners all over Twitter that are saying, uh, I grew up in a really liberal environment and um, I my parents wanted the best for me and I wanted the best for me, but I made a mistake. And that is why you have to approach these things with a, a judicious kind of view and, and approach. And uh, what's being told us now told to us now is no, uh, this is what you're you're supposed to accept. And I won't. I'm one of the people in the community that won't. And my friends, by the way, all agree with me, but they've been scared into submission. Well, yeah, but like, like look, look, the way, like when the dragon awakes and it turns, um, it literally, like there is nothing left of some like individuals who will talk about this. Uh, like, because it's just scorched earth, gone. But like the whole, like the whole thing is, I don't think, I don't know why there isn't like the conversation is not being had more where people are like, I have transitioned, I made a mistake, and now I want to come be like, you know what I mean? That you don't really hear from any, or you don't really hear from anyone. I don't like from myself, like where I sit in like the game of like in the game of life of things. Like yes, um, gay rights, like trans rights like queer rights all of that i'm aware of it but i'm not sort of like a fool like i'm not some i'm not an advocate if you get what i mean i'm just like a guy just living my life and if like if this comes up in the news oh gay people can get married like some years ago great congratulations guys welcome to the world of suffering like the rest of us <laughs> it's like yeah but yeah, because it didn't it didn't particularly maybe affect you. And then you're like, OK, well, it doesn't matter. And that's fine. I, I'm not a trans person. I'm not a trans person in sports. I'm not a, I don't have a daughter in sports, but I also am a person that will not be scared into submission. And when you look at the polling of this stuff, it's not at all what's delivered on you in the man mainstream channels. Most people are reasonable and say, like, of course, someone should be allowed to transition and you should honor their pronouns, but not at nine. And we can't have a situation now you're having. It's been documented of people doing one hour Zoom calls with a doctor that they've never met. They go on for an hour. They say, you know, I think I'm trans. And within an hour, they're able to get hormones and deliver to them that, that they now take no psychiatric evaluation. And now they, they can change their body irreversibly for the rest of their life and possibly regret it. And, and this is this is the problem when you just scare people into submission and there's no checks because no one wants to go, well, I don't want to be called transphobic. So I'll just give the, the nine-year-old hormones. Well, now it's starting to backfire. An hour Zoom call. That is ridiculous. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, <laughs> it, well, I can tell from your voice, it's like quite frustrating uh, for yourself to like, like be like going, why am I having this conversation still? Why this why is this keep on happening? And what do you think some like apart from yourself, what do you think some of the things can be done to help make this better? Get more bring balance to it all. 
Uh, I think that the Democrats and the le- if the Democrats continue to do these petty culture wars over things that are not politically popular at all, mm-hmm. um, I think that they are going to absolutely lose. That's why I saw Trump right after he got elected. He went to CPAC and he was talking about the transports issues because he knows that that issue is something where a lot of liberals and independents would agree with him on. And I don't know why he brought it up out of nowhere. And I thought, ah, that's an that's an issue where people are being told that the average like the population doesn't think this. And so I think these petty culture wars on the left, I think, are absolutely going to give rise to another despotic Trump. It's very much going to be happen. And I think also the failure of the left is like you cannot keep pretending that anybody who has immigration concerns is a xenophobe. You cannot pretend that like certain things aren't happening. Of course, you know, pe- the, the majority of people want immigration, but they want to have some constraints in place, not an open border policy. And very much it was like the left's position was like anybody who questions anything happening at the border is a Trump supporter and is, is a xenophobe. I mean, what most people don't know is Barack Obama built the cages and put the kids in them before Trump. Trump continued the policy. But Biden's still continuing the policy right now. And there's a lot of crisis at the border right now because with climate change, people in Central America, for example, and this is real and this is going to be a huge thing over the next decade, is as climate change affects people, we now have over 10 million climate refugees. So these are farmers in Honduras just cannot grow crops anymore because past 30 degrees Celsius, it's very hard to grow crops. So they're all migrating north now because because they have to survive. And that's going to happen all over the world. It's already starting to happen in different places. And so I think what will fail the Democrats going into the election is if they just don't want to touch this issue because they're scared of being called xenophobic, whereas the average liberal independent voters is going to go, we still, you have to know that we have some concerns with immigration. Mm. Yeah. Like, even though that Biden just got elected, it feels to me. Does he know it? Yeah. I mean, uh, really. Uh, uh, <laughs> let's, not, let's not talk about how how the gentleman walks up a flight of steps. That's enough story. But uh, that, or doesn't know what the Pentagon is. That was a great one the other day. He just forgot the Pentagon. Okay, that's concerning. <laughs> no, um, or, like put that aside. Like it to me, it just felt like yeah, he got elected in, and basically the campaign trail has kicked off again straight away and like it's just going down the, for the next two years to like basically choose like wait is it the house in two years time or is it the senate two, two years it's 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 the midterm elections yeah midterm elections for the house mm-hmm. okay. and then basically after that it's straight on with like who's going to be present in 2024 um will trump come back i don't know Will like someone else who is Candace Owens? Candace is Owens. my prediction, hundred percent. I think it's. A, I think Candace Owens has already gave hints that she's going to run, and I think that is a great choice for them because she's an outsider, so you can't say she's part of the whole, the whole Washington rot. Uh, it's a woman, so they can't play identity politics with her. She's a black woman, yeah. and so they're going to have her come in. She's a well spoken. She's good looking. I mean, I think she's completely outrageous. I don't. I. I think anyone that comp- denies climate change is, to me, is a pseudo intellectual. But I do think that is a perfect example of someone that could, could give rise to someone like her. And and, and that is my prediction. And, and if the left keeps playing these games, if they start censoring people and 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 playing wild games, far left policies, it's going to be a landslide. Yeah, because to me, Candace Owens is a bit like an iceberg. I've seen kind of like 10% of her and like basically that 10%, the rumblings and the talk from other sort of places of like, I uh, can't, I know. It's not, how can I put it? It's not being veiled with a positive realm. If you get with me, like, if you get me, it because, yep. yes, you say she's like, yeah, she is a woman. She is a black woman, but like, she is someone who's quite savvy with the sort of media game uh, today. And that's about all I know about her. I don't know. I don't see, really know where she sort of stands on a lot of things, if you get what I mean. 
So it's kind of like she probably doesn't know either. But isn't it a game at this point? I mean, really, I mean, and the other thing is that I find interesting about Trump, because I'm always interested in the why is that um, even after the past year, um, even after George Floyd, even after the riots, um, even after the things that came flying out of Trump's mouth, he gained with every minority group, including 10 points with LGBT. If that doesn't show you, I mean, the guy had a pandemic, an economy in the toilet and Joe Biden narrowly won. If that doesn't show you how scared the Democrats should be going into the next election is that he tapped into something with people that um, 74 million people are not all racist. They're not all what's touted as white supremacists. And I think the Democrats, they're so in their own mind of this elitist West Coast Hollywood mentality is that they've abandoned the working class. And I think that's if they don't get the working class back, it will be a landslide. No, because I would say with regards to like, yeah, Trump losing the election, like if there wasn't a global pandemic, he would have got a second term. Like I have no doubt in my mind, he would have got a second term. And with regards to talking to the sort of working class or like, well, more of regular people, I let's say regular people. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a case of like, we've got the Labour Party over here, which I think was going kind of down the sort of democratic line. But there's been kind of like a pushback on that. And I'm not too sure where the Labour Party is meant to be going like forward with that, because like the Labour Party would be the party I'd normally vote in. But the last election, it was like, yeah, like it's like this is where I lean left and then lean right on other things. It's like, okay, it's great. You've got all these programs you want to talk about. How are we going to pay for that? What's going to make? Oh, they just keep work? printing money. I mean, that's that's this whole thing. Yeah. The debt bubble is like essentially the whole economic system is just I, I, one of the things I said on my, on my podcast is the entire world slash economy is a Ponzi scheme. Uh, particularly with the environment. I mean, if you look at the very concept of our world, we are a planet. Our economy is based on infinite growth, right? The stock market will always grow up. Pensions will be fine. People will always grow. The businesses will always grow. Well, that cannot be true because the entire economy is based on finite resources, meaning all of our economy is powered by three things, natural gas, coal, and oil. Well, all those things are set to run out in our lifetime. So if you just take that factor alone, then you realize that it's a fantasy uh, very much in the same way that the stock market's a fantasy now. I mean, the dominant like companies on the stock market, Uber, Spotify, Netflix, they don't make money. It used to be that they made a product and it was based on fundamentals. You know, they made so much profit. Now you have companies that are completely just basically fake You print money and you shove it in the stock market. They're not tied to any fundamentals. They don't even have to make a profit. Mm. And it's a fake system that, and it's a debt bubble. It's a housing bubble. It's hyperinflation that is going to pop within the next two to three years. And the question is, does the next person say it's a Candace Owens or whoever the hell the Democrats run? It really will be probably all economy. I think it will be all, and it will be all about the economy because the economy will be in the toilet at that point. Uh, and I think immigration due to climate change. And so the question is, is with the Democrats is if they make it, if they throw a million issues out at once and the average person's like, hey, I just want to feed my family. Yeah. Do they lose? Hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So with regards to like the, quite a deep conversation we're going down, like with yeah. regards to like some of the, like what type of stop gaps do you think should be put like, would you like to see come into play? So like, oh, okay, that's a stop gap and we can start sort of turning things around, say. There needs to be massive taxation of the wealthy. That's the only way that will happen. But the problem is, is the US is a corporate totalitarianism at this point. The, the politicians, it's, it's theater. They're just really puppets for the corporations and the yeah. elites, right? So how do you get something like that through when the average person says, yes, of course, you should continue to tax billionaires who saw their wealth grow massive amounts during the pandemic? Of course, that would be a perfect way to do it. Um, Could you get something like that through? I don't know. I mean, the biggest thing that I'm interested in, because I'm a huge climate junkie, is 
uh, is tackling climate change because I don't think people realize how dire the situation is. I don't think people realize it's not something that's a hundred years from now. It's something like fish are, will run out within 20 to 30 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, oil, we used to have conventional oil extraction. Now all you hear from AOCs and the, and the left is uh, fracking. Oh my God, fracking, it's terrible. We can't frack, it's bad for the environment. It releases methane, it makes the whole problem worse. Correct. But we're only doing that because we ran out of conventional oil extraction. We've moved on to unconventional oil extraction, things like the tar sands and stuff like that, because we are utterly addicted to fossil fuels. It's the only way our economy runs. And the, how do you stop that situation? Because is it politically popular for a politician to come up and be like, hey, the planet's going to shit and the Great Barrier Reef's going to be gone in 10 years and we're running out of soil and the whole thing's going to collapse if we don't start dialing back the capitalism and dialing back the consumption. Well, how do you do that? Because the whole economy is based on capitalism growing. So you turn to people and say, so you can't fly again and you're only you're not even going to get an 8% return on your stocks anymore. You're probably going to get a 1% return. When would that ever be politically popular? And so that's where the, I find the difficulty is we need to have these conversations with people to say the party has to slow down at some point or we're on a suicide mission. The party has to slow down sometime or we're on a suicide mission. <laughs> I mean, it's dark. I mean, I'm dark, but it, it's I'm not wrong in the sense that like every time you fly 32 f- square feet of ice melts every time a person flies. Yeah. So with all this. <laughs> yeah. How do you tie that together? <laughs> like, That'll be your skill. It's like with all this, like with like basically like economics, like the economic situation, the global, like good, the global warming situation, climate change, uh, like basically mass immigration and, and basically, well, the sort of a relentless sort of printing of money. Like, whoo. It's a lot. I know it's a lot. And your audience is going to be like, uh, why did you do this to me? But we're not, we're not lying here. It's just, this is unhealthy realism. It's just what it is. Um, but what's your question, sir? No, I was going to say, would you say, like, telling people to have less, telling people to sort of re like, like change how much they expect from the world or like basically give back something what would you like do you think that's in the capability of some of the people or in society at this present time well i don't know because the vast majority of the population hates their jobs and you see why they're going so crazy in the pandemic is because because they don't enjoy what they do nine to five they find fun in recreational activities Mm. partying traveling uh, buying things they don't need that's where a lot of people find their joy you saw how it made them go crazy so then do you then turn to those people and say you have to dial back on those things which bring you joy um i have a more cynical view of human nature and that i think we're just going to party till the end until it's too bad and uh things will go crazy but the answer is truly uh that you have to reduce consumption that you need to absolutely get off fossil fuels you absolutely need to put all your energy into um green energy everything should be in green energy um you need to tax the wealthy you need to close all the loopholes for rich people um i don't know why amazon can't pay corporate tax that's insane um and you really and you have to close all these loops and the question though it's interesting because this stuff if you told people the stuff about the economy it's politically popular everyone would say of course amazon should pay taxes of course rich people shouldn't hide their wealth in panama but you'll see how much of the government is controlled by the elites and rich people because this it's hard for this stuff to get through look what they did to bernie sanders i mean bernie sanders came forth with very reasonable policy positions like hey i want to give you people health care so you don't go bankrupt and americans essentially looked at him and were like ah too expensive mm. it's crazy yeah no like this is the thing like i think that's for me when they did well i would say did the dirty on bernie uh with regards to this time around for the nomination, I was like, okay. And they kind of didn't look, 
was it Andrew Yang, uh, the other Democratic, and like they kind of was like didn't listen to him, and I was like, I'm Tulsi Gabbard, same thing. All three of them, and it was like, okay, so let me get this straight. Now you're going with a gentleman uh, who is like, like if you had him ten years ago, yes. He would be the sort of right choice but now it's kind of like okay my man needs to like just have a nice country home or have a nice beach house and just be like um, you know what grandkids are coming over and like yeah i'm having a great time it's not what i would say the most forward thinking move by the democrats whatsoever and i'm look i'm not i'm not anti-democratic whatsoever like look if i saw obama i'd run over and give him a hug but like yeah before security take me down that's enough (laughs) (laughs) yeah but it's kind of like i go right what were you thinking like putting like you know i mean biden in and just ignoring everyone else even look even bernie sanders i would say yeah maybe it's time for you to have a beach house as well and have a nice house in the country what I, these people know. are these people don't want that these people are narcissists these people are deeply sick people and they're they're responsible for the rot in the system nancy pelosi is a criminal like she has a 24 percent approval rating and she can't lose power so you wonder i mean but then you know what do the democrats put up like an aoc to me who's like is example of someone else who just has a different kind of authoritarian vibes to her um, she is like a Trump in a lot of ways. She won't work with other people. She said that after Trump left, she wanted to make a list of everyone who supported him so they could go after them like she's in the KGB. Uh, she says that our problems are that cauliflower is racist. Um, she Ted Cruz after the insurrection, Ted Cruz said, let's work together. And she said, no, you tried to kill me like as if Ted Cruz personally tried to kill. Her. I mean, these people are hysterical imbeciles. Yep. And so when people go, yay, AOC, and I'm like, you know what? She has a lot of the right ideas about the climate and about the economy, but she's also a lunatic and she's hysterical. And I don't like anyone that's hysterical because hysterical people are terrible at their jobs. They think based on emotion. And so I don't know. I mean, I think for the Democrats, uh, they have to get back to, they have to get away from Hollywood. They have to distance themselves from elites. They have to get back to working class. Mm. Um, but then I go. Then again, Biden gets in. Uh, wasn't two thousand dollars checks, fourteen hundred. So there's the first lie. Less unemployment benefits than Trump gave to people, and no fifteen dollars minimum wage. So there's no progressive policy going on there. It's the same center corporatist, uh, corporatist nonsense in in uh, Washington. And so I don't know. These things are very complicated. I I think that. I, I very much think that honestly, I think the Republicans have really like you look at Fox, you look at Fox, their numbers are way up. MSNBC is in the toilet. CNN just dropped 45 percent in prime time. People are moving to those places and it's a scary time. Honestly, it's it's a very scary time. But I think that if the Democrats going to w- want to win, they should just be economy, economy, economy. Mm, yeah, uh, you mentioned like you mentioned uh Cortez, like cauliflower racist? Oh yeah, I'll send you the video. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she she wanted them to they had a community garden and she wanted them to grow different plants because she said that cauliflower is racist because it's a colonizer vegetable. I mean these are the these the, these are the wars that they want to wage, these people. I mean, it's 87 genders, like, you know, nine-year-olds should be absolutely of hormones, no questions asked. Yeah. Do you think the average person w- will go on board with that? No. So I don't know. I <laughs> I do think they needed a centrist, but like there is, there is, when be, I'm always interested in the why of Trump and the why of Trump is just that he represents people being disillusioned with the system. He's anti-PC. Everyone's sick about PC culture. So he, that worked. And he was kind of a person who just sort of said exactly what was on his mind. And there's something nice about that. I mean, obviously, I didn't agree with what he was saying, but there's something nice about a person who just lets it fly, mm. you know. And so we'll see. I, I don't know. But for me, the climate is the, is one of the things that um, that would never make me vote for conservative at this point, because it seems to be the Republicans and even the conservative party in Canada 
both have the position that climate change isn't real. At a time when it, there's literally glaciers melting, like Glacier National Park in the U.S. will have no glaciers at all within 10 years. The Great Barrier Reef is gone within 10 years. Soil is gone within 35 years. Fish are gone in 20 to 30 years. These things are undeniably true. And yet you have people saying it's not happening. And for me, that's enough to never let me vote conservative for that reason at, at this point in time. Mm. Well, like, I would just simply say with regards to the sort of weather, uh, which has been happening over the last, well, three to five years in the United, well, in the United States around the co like Gulf Coast area. And um, basically with regards to the big freeze, which happened it, throughout the uh, northern, like a part of America, uh, only about four weeks ago, where it went from all the way from Canada all the way down to like Texas, which was like, what the hell? <laughs> Texas is normal. Yeah. So what that is is you fucked with the Gulf Stream, uh, the jet stream. You fucked with the jet stream due to climate change, yeah. and you get a polar vortex system. So you that's when it transfers. It goes all the way south, like it happened in Texas. Yeah. Again, this is well-documented, well-predicted climate change things. There are parts of India that are running out of water. They have to have it trucked in. There's parts of Bangladesh that will just be, you won't be able to live there within 20 years. I mean, there's predicted by within a uh, hundred years, there'll be over a billion climate refugees moving at any point. So this is how dire it is. There's already 10 million on the move right now. Mm. And you have people who get up, who are sponsored by Exxon, and all these fossil fuel companies that just get up there and say, it's not happening. It's not happening. And that to me is so, so that to me is the issue that I think, because none of this will matter if we don't have a planet. Like with regards to like, how have you managed to find other people, allies out there who want to fight the good fight? Or is it a case of you might be ice skating uphill at this present time? I talk about it on my podcast. I did a, I did a podcast episode called Collapse where I interviewed a guy. I, I belong to a Reddit uh, subreddit called Collapse, and it's basically a, a group of people that have realized that we are in the start of economic and environmental collapse um, and point to the various reasons. It's a news aggregator, but also we kind of just discuss certain things. And I had him on the show and I talked about him and we kind of busted through green energy and the lie of that and many things. But these are very, very dark subjects because you're basically turning to the average person and saying, yeah, society's about to collapse probably within your lifetime. Who the hell wants to listen to that? Most people want to live in what's called functional denialism, where they just say, I don't want to talk about it or explore it. So I don't touch it too much because at some point I'll have no audience and I'll be impoverished. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm right. I will say I'm right. I'm, I'm a climate nerd. Mm. And I will say to people, another perfect example is Tesla is a stock scam. Tesla is based on the premise that we will just have electric cars. Well, electric cars require lithium if we convert all cars to lithium that means we can have electric cars there's enough lithium in the world for about 10 years do you see the problem here is that we keep digging into the ground and taking out things to do things that have an expiry date on them that's why we ran out of conventional oil and we started fracking because instead of us saying okay we have to do something else we just kept stealing from the earth and every time you steal from the earth it makes the problem worse so the answer is to dial back capitalism, but that's again, the impasse. You dial back capitalism, job loss, the stock market crumbles. So who the hell is going to sign up for that? No, no. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> my God, my God. <laughs> okay. Wow. All I've got to simply say is, wow. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go cut your wrist now after this interview. <laughs> my wrist will be secure, but like, yeah. What I've got to simply say, I wouldn't say I expected this podcast to go the way it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know what? This is what I love about doing podcasts. Sometimes it's just, yeah, you go, it should be going this way. No, it just, like, I'm the type of person, like, lets my podcast go free and see how it grows and evolves. And, like, look, I like this conversation. Yeah, this, it's wonderful. I'm like, thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Sorry to bum people out, though. I do know I have to watch it because my friends are like, can you stop, please? Because <laughs> they know I'm right. That's the problem is they know I'm right in a lot of ways and they know I'm a nerd. I'm a science nerd. So they know I know what I'm talking about, but it makes it real to them when I tell them, like, 
the scary things about the planet. Um, so I try not to do it too much on my show. Um, but again, I explore this a lot on my show. I talk about the environment a ton. Oh, no, I'm, I appreciate it. And you know what? It's helped get my mind thinking about other things uh, which I should be paying attention. Like, yeah, i um, a little bit terrified that if Car- Candace Owens gets in, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like a, or like, yeah, worse still, maybe someone even maybe darker or worse than like Candace Owens or Trump um, put together, which could be a possibility that, yeah, you know what I mean? I don't fancy that, but still. <laughs> no. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I've yeah, I've got to say, like, yeah, this conversation, I really have appreciated this conversation. Like, apart, like, moving aside from sort of climate change and everything like this, you mentioned you want to, like, one of the future goals is get to a million downloads per episode. Like, would there be, like, would you be looking at doing a second book or like something else in the next few years or is this it i'm working on my book right now but um i'll be frank like my mental health uh hasn't been the greatest and when you're writing a book you really need all your faculties like it's it's a very difficult rigorous thing to do um i think anyone that wants to take it on the editing process for me alone took four months Um, and by the end you want to light it on fire because you've literally read it and edited it like 20 times. So, uh, I've been slowly chipping away at it. I think when things open up a bit more and I can exercise and see people and eat well, then I think I'll go back to it. But the biggest thing for me is the show and then stand up, like actually, uh, doing live stand up shows, which is something I haven't done for a year and a half now. Um, so I, Listen, I can do stand up and I can do bits on my show and I try them out all the time and we make them into clips and that's what I post on my Instagram, but it's very, very different live and I actually like it way more because this digital realm that we live in is not real. There's no eye contact. You don't pick up on cues. It's just staring at a screen. Yeah. And so I want to get back out there and actually see people and meet people and shake their hands and, uh, you know, sign books and things that I got to do before. So we'll see. I mean, but my big thing is with the show is that like, I'm super hard on myself, so I continuously want to improve. I want to become a better broadcaster, more fluid. Um, So I have a lot of room to grow with the show, but um, the trend that we're on, I mean, when people find out about my podcast, they absolutely love it. So I think that's a really good sign. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Look, I'm going to have to reveal that, yes, I am a being of supreme cosmic power. Ah, yes. I can grant you one wish, and before you even start, no world peace. (laughs) Uh, And yeah, uh, no sort of writing down everything on a list and going, yes, I want that to happen. And look, no getting rid of COVID because, hey, everyone wants that. And look, I've called upon the great and powerful Dolly Parton. And look, pulling on those, those resources, it is taxing to say the least. Like, yeah. Like, Frig, I'm, I'm going to have to owe her uh, a number of people's first ball, not mine, other people's. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. If I could give you one wish, what would that one wish be? Oh, God. Is this a question you ask everyone? Look, look, I've owned, look, so far I've been grant, like I've managed to grant a number of wishes. I can't go into full details. Yeah. Um, I mean, just, I just think my health, I think that's all that matters really now. Just, uh, to stay healthy for as long as possible, I guess, if that's, if that's a wish, um, probably though, from a selfish perspective would be like to sell at a comedy theater. Like that would be the ultimate goal. Uh, thousands of people just kind of doing something like that. Like I've done small venues, but like, I think something like that. Um, so that would be my wish as if I keep saying this as if this is real, it's going to happen, but Yes, omnipotent being. Yes, you you uh can grant me that. Okay, no worries. I'll get working on that for you. And look, <laughs> Jordan, I've got to say, look, thank you for coming on today. You, <laughs> you are an, like you're an enigma and a question and enigma. <laughs> it's like which I look forward to having you back on sometime in the future, where definitely can talk a a lot more look i didn't even go into the whole sort of like yeah funny stories and like the way just read my book famous ain't as you can go you can go uh read those stories for yourself (laughs) 
<laughs> Love it. Uh, can you tell the lovely people how they can reach you out there, Lisa? Sure. So my podcast is Unmentionable every Friday on all players. You can watch it on YouTube or my uh, Instagram is JPower Comedy. My Twitter is JPower Comedy, but I don't really do much on there. But uh, yeah, and you can buy my book, Famous Sanus. And uh, yeah, give me a follow. Excellent. Excellent. Please, people, you lovely people out there, go follow Jordan. And like these many exploits. Oh, my God. If you knew. <laughs> if you knew. <laughs> oh, they'll know when they read the book. They'll know. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'd like to say stay well, stay safe, my friends, my life warriors. Please be awesome. Be excellent. Be fantastic. Be all the positive things you can be out there and then some. Ah, uh, have a great day, guys. Yeah, peace. And we are...